Right. So feed in the British soldier of the First World War. Click. Oh, brilliant. So who were the men feeding the First World War soldier? But they're cooks. So there's a lot of stigma during the First World War, a little few myths added in there, here and there. But it was actually more professional of what people make it out to be. So we're going to do a bit of myth busting in this next 20 minutes. And it's going to be an overview as well. Because I could quite easily go into a massive tangent all down these little avenues, but I want to keep it as simple as possible. So feeding the British soldier took a big turn in the 1880s, really, um, when they, the army sort of took it more seriously. So the big innovation was obviously the soya stove. You can see one over there with the field kitchen on the corner. That was a big innovation, very good for central feeding of the soldier. But they started working more on their diet, but when by the 1880s, they were taking it more seriously with the training of the cooks. There's more learning on the job. That's how they sort of had it, and that's where all this stigma comes from, you know, cooks not being able to cook properly and stuff like that. They're actually doing cooking competitions, so they'll have regimental cooking competitions, um, but then by 1919, no, 1919, 1900, sorry, they're actually doing proper training. So your army cook is going on a cookery course for about six weeks, and then he'll come back to his battalion and then he'll then learn the rest of his trade on the job. But the Army Catering Corps does not exist at this time. They don't exist until 1942. In the, second, in the First World War, it was always down to your battalion. So all these men were trained infantrymen. So we're going to look at it from the infantry perspective, not from the cavalry and the artillery and everybody else try and keep it basic. So we're looking at it from an infantry battalion's perspective. They are trained infantry soldiers. Okay, so they've done their basic training as an infantryman. Most likely they would have gone into a company and actually served a couple of years in a company and then moved over to the cooking side of things. But how did they become a cook? Well, the easiest way to explain it is they volunteered. That is the easiest way to explain it. Because you can't have a pressed man as a cook. If you've got a pressed man as a cook, he's not going to deliver the product to a high standard. And the army knew that. So generally, in the cookhouse, you would find, as a cook, these are men who are usually around about the 15 years mark. So they've done about 15 years in the army. Or the blokes who have suffered injuries during training or abroad, but they're very good soldiers, and they want to keep them in battalion. They might be a battalion character or something like that, and they go, well, the plate, you know, we need to keep you here. So the only thing they can offer this soldier could be a cook's position. They go, look, make you a cook, and then you can stay. If you don't take that, we've got to discharge it because we can't help you. Then they'll go and do the cookery course, come back and go and so on and so forth. Other blokes will join the battalion and they'll be in the battalion for a matter of months and they go, actually, I quite like the cooking life. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, go through that route. But what I say is they're not pressed men because if you've got pressed man, he won't deliver. <laughs> So what is involved in this six weeks cookery course? Well, everything condensed right down. So the soldier is going to learn about nutrition, what to be feeding a soldier, basic butchery and basic baking. All of that is covered in that six week period. So these men, when they're going back to their battalion, they're cooking for about 150 men a day. That's what they're doing at each meal time. So they work in pairs. So it sort of works out that each battalion has around about 10 cooks, if they're lucky. <laughs> so once they've done their cookery course and they've gone to their battalion, what does their kitchen look like? I don't know how well you can see that from where you are, but that's, a, that's actually a field kitchen um, at a temporary camp. So remember, during the First World War, the army just exploded in number. 
and we had to make temporary camps to try and accommodate as many soldiers as we could. This is one of the cookhouses. Now, with the light, it doesn't show it in greater detail, but in Southie's field kitchen, in, in basically a corrugated shed um, with an open front. But on the other side is the, what we call the cookhouse building. That's where the lads are actually eating their meals. So the lads are eat, eating their meals in the building here. Well, everything's being cooked outside on a field kitchen. If they're very, very lucky, they will go to an established kitchen. So what I mean by an established kitchen is it has all the mod comms. So this is an established camp that's been around for years. And um, so they don't have all this field kitchen um, appliances. They've actually got gas, running water, boilers. So a chef of today walked into one of these established kitchens, they will identify every piece of kit in that kitchen because that kit is still used today. Some of it at a basic level, on some of it maybe the design is a little bit different, but a modern day chef, or indeed a British Army chef, walking into that environment, he will know exactly what is what. There's been no change in the equipment that they're using. So this here is a feeding plan, or an example of a feeding plan. So the British soldier is eating in the UK around about 4,700 calories, no, 4,300 to 500 a day. That's quite a lot. But when he goes on to active service, he'll be eating anything between 4,500 to 4,700. And the army knew they needed to keep that amount of calories in the soldier. So they came up with these 17 day feeding plans. So if you, this is actually from the British Iron Manual of Army Cookery 1915. And this is one of the feeding plans. It runs for 17 days. So what we've got is, uh, let's try and see if I've got to do this. I'll actually go from the screen. Because that'll be better. Right. So on a normal day, we'll go from the top one. The top one, so these breakfast, so this is menu number two. Every breakfast you will get porridge. Porridge is with every single breakfast you'll have, be it either you're on the front line or you're at home. On this particular day, you're going to get tea, bread and butter, fried bacon and tomatoes. That is your breakfast. The lads will have elevenses, as they like to call it. Uh, when I just take, when I go to the naffy, they'll get a currant bun and a cup of tea. Around about that, but that's out of their own pocket. That's not being provided for by the army. That's their own choice. Then lunch is their lunch is their main meal of the day. So they're calling it dinner. And dinner on menu two is Irish stew, dumplings, bread and butter, and uh, bread and butter pudding. So that's their lunch. Then they have afternoon tea at around about four o'clock. But that is provided to you by the army. So you'll get tea or coffee, bread, bread and butter and jam on this particular day. And then later in the evening, at around about seven, eight o'clock at night, you'll then have supper. So on menu two, you've got lentil soup, cheese, cheese, pickles and bread. So when they say pickles, that's anything you can think that's been pickled. Pickled cauliflower, pickled carrots, anything you can pickle, <laughs> that's what they're eating, that's what they're referring to as pickles. So that's just one feeding plan. And that in itself, that would be around about 4,500 calories. Now when the British soldier joined the army at the time, that's the other thing they had to remember as well, was these men are coming from very different situations to what we're from today. The British soldier of 1914, so your regular professional soldier, on average, I'm not saying it's every single man, on average, he has come from the lower spectrum of society. Also, we're working in a class system. They've come from the poor, the working poor, or the lower class. That is literally where they've come from. And it's not any different. First of all, when it war started, you've now got this explosion of different social standings. So you've now got 
middle class, upper middle class, you know, all getting in, all mucking in, doing the same thing. But these lads who have come from, say, the slums of Manchester, or London, Birmingham, places like that, they're malnourished. In a pre-war army, they will not be recruited because they don't meet the height and weight. But we just needed men. <laughs> so they go. So when they got to battalion, because of this 4,500 calorie intake every single day, so your average lad from the slums, he'll gain three stone in weight, two inches on his chest and about two inches in height within six months. That's because he's being given nourishment. Because remember, this lad, he's lucky if he's eating meat once a week when he was at home. If anything, he's eating uh, a gruel-like soup. That is probably standard. And he'll probably eat meat once a week. Uh, or he'll be eating bread constantly. It'll be bread with something on it. So that shows the spectrum where these lads are coming from. Even lads who are coming from this situation, you think, oh, brilliant. The army's done a brilliant turn by giving them all this food. But they weren't used to it. They struggled to eat it. They're like, well, we just don't, I don't eat bread because that's all I can afford back home. But now you're giving me beef stew and bangers of mash and stuff like that. Like, I, I, they had to force them to eat it, literally. It was like, you are eating it, you are refusing the king's meal. And obviously that then has consequences. <laughs> but they had to force them to eat it and get used to it. To the extent where bread was a constant thing for them. They're always having bread all the, all, all the time because it's their social uh, background as well. Because to them, bread is life. So if they don't have bread, they're not going to eat their food. So when we move into the front line, so we've gone from the UK, and also I'd say also from behind the line as well, the way we're feeding them. So we know already established they're actually eating pretty good food, aren't they? I'd eat it. <laughs> <laughs> So moving food up onto the front line, uh, so we've got the photograph here, and this is the late war period, around about 17 I think it is, where the food's been brought up in a Dixie, um, and dishing out the scarf. They will try their utmost to give you decent food on the front line, but obviously it doesn't always work out like that. So that doesn't really show up very well, but I will read it out to you. So this is the daily ration of a British soldier, be it either on the front line or his ration in general. So this is what we're looking at. I've also done the conversion, but I've done it all out into grams. So I've worked it all out, so all of us younger ones haven't got to try and work it out in ounces and pounds and things like that. <laughs> Bread, you're getting 566 grams of bread a day, or you're getting 340 grams of biscuit. That's your hard tack, all right? Or your draw breakers, as they call it. You're going to get 566 grams of meat, or if you're using tinned meat, it's 453. 17 grams of tea, 85 grams of sugar, 14 grams of salt, 0.7 grams of pepper, 1.5 grams of mustard, 113 grams of jam, 133 grams of bacon, 85 grams of cheese, and in vegetables, 226 grams, or dried vegetables at 56 grams. Butter, margarine, oatmeal, rice and milk. Those weren't regulated. That's as much as you want, boys. Fill your boots. And that comes up to 4,500 4, calories. So that's, in an ideal world, that is what our soldier is eating. On a daily basis. So what did the field kitchens look like on the front line? Well, it's one of them. No field kitchen will look the same. It's all down to the situation of what these blokes are in. So you might have a setup like these blokes have done, where they just cut holes into the side of the trench. So they're probably just adjacent to the front line. They're probably sat in the secondary trench or the reserve trench, 
and they've made this makeshift little kitchen because when they move up onto the front line, they're designated to their company. So these two cooks, they're cooking for their company. They're no longer cooking for the battalion. They'll only cook for the battalion when they come off the line. Bread. We like bread. Um, so bread, as I mentioned before, is the giver of life and bread is the most important food source of human civilization. And soldiers have been eating it since the Romans. As I mentioned earlier, the British Army cook was taught how to make bread and had bake, bake, and basic bakery skills. However, that wasn't his job because the thing is, you've got to make bread for a thousand men. That's a lot of manpower throughout the day. It takes roughly on average, I think it's like five men per one thousand men to make bread. So it's going to take five bakers to make bread for one thousand men a day. So that takes up a lot of time. Remember, your kitchen staff is only about 10, and if it, that's if you're lucky. Now you'll see photographs of the kitchen staff where you think, oh look, there's loads of them there. Well, there isn't. You've got 10 cooks, and all the other blokes are all on fatigues and jankers. All right? So these are blokes who are doing the pot washing, the peeling of potatoes. These are all the blokes from the battalion. They've either been given it as a duty or as a punishment. So, yeah, so they're pot washers, basically. <laughs> Uh, so, Bread fell under the jurisdiction of the Army Service Corps. They were in charge of the bread making. They were also in charge of the butchery as well. So, the butchery of meat and the baking of bread all fell down to the Army Service Corps. So, set up massive bakeries. There was a big one in Calais, Boulogne, Dunkirk. Um, I think there was one more, but this is a, a massive industrial scale of bakery. They've even got electric mixers in some of these places, or well, some of them are actually pounding it by hand. And they're working day and night, they're in a shift rotation. You're going in at 6 in the morning, you're doing your 12 hour shift, you're going to sleep, the next shift comes in, does the night shift, and so on and so forth. And they have no quota, they're not going, right, you need to make X amount of loaves of bread today. It's like, just make bread, that is your job, just make it. So you think, well, we've got all these bakeries, you've got blokes churning out thousands of loaves of bread every single day. They're getting fresh bread every day. No, they're not getting fresh bread every day. You'd like to think they were, but they're not because they're not got the additives in the breads that we put in today. So today we've got palm oil and other muck that goes into bread. They haven't got that, it's literally yeast, salt, water and flour. That's all they've got. The bread would only last fresh for about a day to two days. So they've cooked the bread, ate the bread, sorry. They've now gone into storage. And this is one of the storage rooms. That's probably gonna be sat in the storage room for a day. Sat in the storage room for a day, Move on to transportation, that's taken a day. It's moved up to the front line. And now it's moved on to the front line. It's gonna sit in the reserve for another day. So that's four days this bread has been sat waiting for consumption. Day five, it's now finally made it up onto the front line and the blokes are now getting their bread ration for five days ago. But there is a perk. The closer to the bakery you are, the fresher your bread is. And that was fact as well. Those blokes who had just come off the line, they've been on the line for a very long time. The regiment name escapes me now. They're on the line for so long, they came back, they were given fresh bread. They ended up going to like Calais or somewhere like that to have a proper wind down and chill out. Obviously you've got the big bakeries in Calais. They're like, here you go boys, fresh bread. They had it and it gave them gut trouble because they weren't used to it. They've been eating stale bread for the last six or five months. When it comes to food of the First World War, we can't, you know, we can't not talk about the notorious bully beef and biscuit and ticklers jam, or plum and apple jam, and the, uh, how was it, mon 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 coaching, monocoche, I always say it wrong. Um, Mac Macanocci, Macanocci, that's the one. Macanocci. 
McCullough which is like a stew. Sorry? That's the one. Well done, man at the back. Um, yeah, so you've got manicotti, which was like a stew. It was a very basic beef stew, and it wasn't very nice at all. Lots of veteran accounts say it was just horrible. You'd open the lid, and you'd have like baby's heads on the top of it. They looked like the shapes of baby's heads. It was always very runny. There was no substance to it. Everything tasted the same. It was really, really bland. So. But that comes in the field service ration. So that's like an emergency meat ration. Bully beef, that's part of your meat. Um, so really what the lads are facing on the front line, they're only eating these items. They are trying to get hot food to you, but you're not gonna get hot food all the time. Why? Because you've got shell fire, you've got things like that going on. You're just not going to get fresh food to them because of disruption. So this is where this becomes really notorious. Tickler's jam. Plum and apple jam was the most common jam on the Western Front. Why? No one knows. It's, we, I think personally, it's my belief, that was the cheapest contract. They were plum and apple jam with Tickler's, and they used to, they used to um, put all sorts of muck in it as well, at Tickler's. They'd, um, from what I've managed to try and find out, they were putting things like Swede and parsnip into it and mix it up with the uh, apples and the plums. Army contracts, isn't it? The army doesn't care, do they? They're just pay they're paying them to make it. Like, that's all right, we just bulk it out, make loads of it, 100% profit. That's what they're looking at. So that's where you get the uh, plum and apple jam up to the line. Bread substitute, your hard tap biscuit, flour, salt, water, jaw breakers, loads of them, loads of names over the years. They're literally like a dog biscuit, like a dog rusk biscuit, but that is your bread substitute. A lot of blokes used to make it into a porridge, they put it into the mess tin, put some water on it or some condensed milk, heat it up, stir it up and have it like a porridge. Because remember dental care weren't as good as it is today, so there's blokes biting on it and losing teeth. So in this whistle stop tour of the last 20 minutes, I hope you've got now a better understanding of what the British soldier was eating and it weren't as bad as what some people make it out to be. It only got really bad when they got to the front line, they weren't getting a decent scuff. So I hope you've learned something from this and uh, if you've got any questions, I'll be at the club. <laughs>
It wasn't that some of them that was horsemen. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, this is something I get quite often when people go, yeah, they're eating horses. Well, horses are very important to the British Army. When you put it into like a, like a statistic, is there was three horses for every soldier that was serving on the Western Front from our from our from our end of it anyway. So for one soldier there was three horses. So that horse was either part of the artillery pulling gun carriages, they were driving with the horses, they were doing all sorts of them, all sorts of things. So they're very, very important animals to us and we're starting to run out of them as well because that's why it's very hard to find traditional, say British breeds of horse in this country. It's because the because the First World War killed them all. That's why exactly, that's, right. that's why you end up getting all these like American breeds coming in. That's that, that's that's the reality of, of the say traditional British breed of horse. I don't I don't too, know too much into horses, but they do want it. Sorry. Oh, the day go hunting. Yeah. Um. Yeah. You, you you hear like little stories of blokes, you know, the old poachers and things like that. They go out and set snare traps and things like that when in the field adjacent to them off the line. You do hear about things like that happening. But actually going off hunting, it was a, something that you, know, you hear about the officers doing it. Um. You know, you have got the officer class. They 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 has been known from do fox hunts as well. <laughs> like. Um. So they'll do fox hunts when they're off the line, either they'll all find a fox or they'll just chase one of the blokes around on somebody's back or something like that. Um, but yeah, so that was... They're still doing it now, is it stopped? Is it What's that? Fox hunting. Oh, well, I'm pretty sure it's banned now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned... Uh, Sorry, he mentioned tack biscuits mixed with condensed milk. Yeah. How how plentiful was condensed milk? Oh, they could get it by the ton. Yeah. Because it's um because it's tins, they just throw it in the sandbags and send it up the line. So it was all part of that emergency ration. So it was really easy to get to get your condensed milk. And if you're off the line, you're more likely to still be on the condensed milk anyway. Um, even in the UK as well, because it's just e it's just easy, easy to transport. It can sit in the stores for ages and things like that. But they were using fresh milk as well. Thank you very much. That's right, no worries. But fresh milk was if and when they could. Hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please click on the like button below so that I know what people like and I know what to make more of. Uh, alternatively, if you've enjoyed it and think you'd like to see more, please click on the subscribe button. That way you get notified by YouTube whenever I bring out a new video. And you never know, there might be something in there that you hadn't considered, because I do cover a variety of things on the channel. And finally, if you have a little bit of cash going, uh, I now have a Patreon account. Um, I'm always looking for patrons because at the end of the day, let's be perfectly honest, it's a good way for me to get a little bit of money that will use to buy review items or to travel to museums and so on. Uh, I don't put a huge amount on that. At the minute all we've got is one tier charging a pound uh, a month which just as I say helps cover my costs. See you soon.